Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for a time of meditation. I invite you to find a comfortable position in your seats. Close your eyes if you wish and take a few deep breaths. Let go of any distractions or worries that may be on your mind. yourself in me pour yourself into my heart pour yourself in me pour yourself into my heart oh Wonderful Spirit, oh, oh, oh. wonderful Spirit, and pour your love in me, pour your love into my your love in me, pour your love into my heart, oh, wonderful So let's take a moment now to give ourselves the gift of meditation, which is simply to be still and allow the beauty that we are to express in fullness. And the passage I'm going to take today is from an 18th century Dzogchen master, Tibetan Buddhist master of the great perfection called Rigzen Yingme Lingpa. And he wrote this, he said, the pith essence of the great perfection is to dwell in the natural radiance of all that occurs at one with actions, energies, and thoughts, and beyond all contrived boundaries of view and meditation at ease in the naked clarity of the present moment. So the pith essence, the essential nature of who we are, the great perfection that we are in truth, is to dwell naturally, easily, harmoniously in that radiance of all that occurs, whatever it might be. We are safe in this universe. It is unfolding according to perfect divine order. So we dwell in that natural radiance of all that occurs at one with actions, energies, and thoughts. Whatever arises in our bodies, in our emotions, in our minds, 
we are one with those elements. We don't resist them. We'll let them flow, do their natural thing. We are beyond all contrived boundaries of view and meditation. We don't have to fix it, make it right, do it a certain way, look at it in the right way. We simply allow the intrinsic intelligence, beautiful wisdom, pellucid love that we are to express in and through every action every energy, every thought, beyond boundaries, at ease. Ah, yes, at ease in the naked clarity of this present moment. And I love that line, the naked clarity. It's open, it's receptive, there are no secrets. Everything is available. We are that. We are that beauty, that joy, that peace, that intelligence, and that power. So in that awareness, now let us move into a moment of silence as we appreciate who we are this day and every day. Natural, great perfection in action, in the silence. And so as we come forth now from this time of meditation, we give thanks for this gift of being present to the beauty that we are. We are that natural great perfection. We are enthused, enlivened, receptive and open to new understanding, new information, new ways to be more loving and giving in our world. And for all that, we say thank you Father, Mother, God, and so it is. Amen. One power, one power, one power. There's one power invisible and you see it everywhere and every day. One power indescribable and you speak of it with every word you say. Mysterious until you know the truth as simple as the love inside of you. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord, call it Buddha, Bahaluha, angels' wings, or heaven's door. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the power of the love in you and me. One power, one power, one power. We speak so many languages, have different clothing, different colors, different names. But different is only dangerous 
when we forget that in our hearts we're all the same we'll remember when we close our eyes and see that such differences were never meant to be call it god call it spirit call it jesus call it lord call it buddha baluha hakim or heaven's door it's mohammed it's your mind it's your soul and it's your sign it's the universe it's music mother earth or father time but whatever name you give it it's all one power can't you see whatever name you give it it's the very air we breathe it's the power of love in you and me one power one power one power it's the moment of creation it's an everlasting peace it's the freedom of forgiveness it's the sweetness of release it's the joy of inspiration it's the sunshine on your face it's the birthright of all nations it's the boundlessness of space it's the beauty of a baby the serenity of sleep it's the anger we abandon its love that's most deep its one power one power one power it's the power of the love that lives forever in you and me it's the power of the Thank you, David. What a wonderful song. What a wonderful rendition. And it really sums up everything we're going to talk about today. So we could just skip to the end of the service and, uh, and not wor worry about it. <laughs> no, I think I got a few, a few things to say. Yeah, it's great to be back at the, uh, the community again. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation. Um, obviously a very gathered, loving community. I thoroughly enjoyed being with everybody the last time and I'm enjoying it again today. And uh, we're, our theme is how to have a direct experience of truth because there's a difference, isn't there, between knowing the truth intellectually right up in our heads or saying beautiful words or singing even beautiful songs and then living it. How do we live that? We, we know the truth, we, we understand it, we appreciate it, but having a direct experience of it is sometimes a little different, right? I don't think it's unusual though. I was at a, a community, a Unity community in Albuquerque a couple of weeks ago and uh, conducted a workshop there. And um, we took a straw poll, how many people had had a mystical experience, a, a direct connection with the divine. And I think it was like 99% of people put their hands up. And I'm sure if we took that same straw poll today, um, we'd find that many people in this group have had some kind of mystical experience, whatever you mean by mystical experience. What I mean by it is a direct appreciation of the divine, a direct appreciation of the truth of our being. Rather than having heard it, we know it, right? Um, and I love that when they interviewed uh, Carl Jung just before he died, um, when the interviewer asked him, uh, you know, the great psychologist, uh, Carl Jung, they, they asked him, did, did he believe in God? And uh, he said, no, I know God. And I thought that was lovely because there's a difference between believing something, right, and, and knowing it to be the truth. 
unfortunately, things get in the way, don't they? Uh, distractions. I'm glad you're doing this work on uh, democracy and remembering the truth of what's happening for our country, because that is so important for us to stay centered in distracting times. And unfortunately, education itself tends to distract us away from the truth of our being, right? It, it teaches us that there's a world of three-dimensional reality, perhaps, but the spiritual world is is gone. It's, I know it was for me and for many years uh, until I came back to it in my in my late teens. Uh, so life itself tends to um, lead us in, in other directions uh, and certainly not uh, giving us the idea that we can have direct experiences with God. In fact, we're kind of nuts if we do, right? We're a little strange, we're a little suspect. The very word mystic sounds like mumbo jumbo doesn't it you know, he's a mystic and all that whereas to me a mystic is, is a high calling of somebody that's actually daring to go beyond uh, conventional reality and it, we get to the stage where it's like who am i who am i to even become a spiritual being i i, I better not do that I need to fall in line with the doctrines and dogmas of of religion then, though, we can be on the spiritual path, and if we're not careful, our egos take over. Um, and have you never noticed this? Sometimes your ego can take over, and you go, oh, I've got it now. I've discovered it. And when you understand like I do, you'll get it too. I hope there's not anybody here that's had that experience, but it, we tend to get a little bit arrogant sometimes with our truth. Because it's, it's so exciting. You know, when we make a, a breakthrough into the truth, we say, oh, my goodness, now I've got it. Now I understand. And we're convinced that we're enlightened. Now, folks, if you're convinced that you're enlightened, you probably aren't, right? Because who is convinced? You know, it's probably our egos. It's our humanness that's convinced. When we're truly enlightened, it's very natural. It's very effortless. It's like that song. It's, it's just natural. It's in everything. And so we have to relax into that knowledge. So just be aware that there's a tendency for us to spiritualize our egos if we're not careful, to be enlightened in our heads. Eric Butterworth, the great unity minister and writer, he said, we can get overread and underdone. And I've always liked that one, overread and underdone. We know too much information, but we haven't taken it down. What's the longest journey? that you can ever take, folks, from your head to your heart, right? It's very short in, in physical distance, but long in terms of integrating the truth of who you are. And another aspect of spiritual arrogance is that we tend to spiritually bypass things, right? So we don't want to look at problems. We're going to go straight to the solution. And we're bad about this in unity sometimes. We're sort of Pollyanna. We want to be positive all the time. I love being positive but not at the expense of denying what's really going on. You know, if we're in pain, if we're in difficulty, we have to be honest about that. And if we're overly positive, too much uh, spiritual materialism is what Chogyan Trungpa said back in the day, the great Tibetan Buddhist master. Um, we tend to spiritualize uh, the, the human experience in the wrong way. You know, we try and opt, opt out from feeling. And it's a full integration spirituality, right? We have to be honest to all levels of our being. So if you're feeling down, don't try and deny it. Just accept that, yeah, I'm down right now. And it's not always going to be that way. But I'm being honest with who I am. So no spiritual bypassing. And I think um, Reverend, uh, your, your minister next week, right, Richard, is going to talk about that. Because what was it? Positive toxicity. So he's going to cover that, that those themes next week. So I'll, I'll let him get on with that. That's going to be very interesting. But we sort of dropped it in today. So that's enough about the problems. And now let's spend the rest of the time talking about uh, solutions to having a direct experience of the truth, right? Because we want to dwell on the all the things that could go wrong. Are you ready for the, the good stuff? Yeah? Let's go. All right, so I've got 10 things, and I'm sure there's more than 10, but 10 is good for today, I think. So these are some ways that we can uh, move ourselves in the direction of having a direct experience of the truth. Number one, be honest, right? which is really what we just said just now. 
be honest, be genuine. Don't try and opt out into some kind of cloud, uh, la la land or false positivity. Be genuine with where you are at any given time, because that's the door to freedom, folks. If you are down and out and feeling awful and you're honest about it, you're free from that down and out. You're only limited to it when you can't look at it, when you try and deny it, when you try and get beyond it, right? But the minute you embrace it, the minute you're on, honest about it and general about it, then you're free from it. You have the key to being uh, beyond that limitation. But it has to be genuine, right? I like to say warts and all. Accept yourself, warts and all. Be you in all your rich variety, right? Um, I think this, this helps as you get older that you look at yourself and not take yourself quite so seriously. But maybe, I don't know, it, it, it helps me to be older, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't need to be old to get this as well. You can be a young whippersnapper and, and still be genuine. There's a combination, be humble and yet confident. And that sounds like a contradiction, right? But I think the the spiritual path dwells in seeming contradictions and seeming paradoxes so to be um humble but confident uh jesus said in, in a similar context he said become as wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove right seeming contradiction again and i love it it means nobody's full right wise in the ways of the world and yet also innocent and open like a child in fact, Jesus talked about that, you know, being wise, but also be, becoming as a child. So it's that balance, isn't it? It's that delightful balance of being confident in who you are, but also humble, teachable. Are you still teachable? Not if you are. Everybody's teachable. If you're teachable, you're still alive, you're, you're functioning, you're doing good, right? The minute you say, no, I've got the t-shirt, I, I got every, I, I know everything, I don't need any more information, then whoops, watch out, we're getting close to death, right? I'm not talking about physical death, psychic death. We must remain teachable and open. So that's the first thing. Be, be honest with yourself, wherever you are at any given time, because that is the doorway right there to open to a direct experience of truth. Because you're no longer hiding from yourself. You're being genuine and honest and open. And that's going to accelerate the movement of spirit into your life. Number two, laugh at life and at yourself. Sometimes it's hard to laugh at life, isn't it? Especially in our present crazy situation but laughing at ourselves and i'm not saying denigrating ourselves i'm saying laughing in a buoyant way is good medicine it's good medicine for our bodies because it oxygenates our lungs and our whole being in that sense our physical being but it's good medicine in, in mentally too because it creates buoyancy in our mind if you can laugh at something don't not take it too seriously I grew up in fairly poor circumstances, and my uh, my mother and grandmother were even more uh, poverty-stricken back in the day in Wales, back at the turn of the 20th century. But they were always full of buoyancy and laughter, and uh, their key was to have a cup of tea and a bit of fun. And I've always liked that. I've taken that with me all my life. So every day I have a cup of tea and a bit of fun because it's my shorthand for staying buoyant and laughing and not taking things too seriously, right? And if you're into coffee, have a cup of coffee and a bit of fun, folks. Um, so in, in other words, lighten up. Don't take it too seriously. And it, it, in fact, sometimes, you know, the worst experiences can be the best, right? Have you ever noticed this? When you came through them, you realized that was my greatest lesson. That was great. My greatest learning was in that difficulty. And, and, and because I chose to, to see it as such, then it's become a great blessing. And if you want to speed up the good, laugh, have a good time, have some fun. And again, not at the expense of anyone, but not taking ourselves too seriously. So that's number two. And by the way, if you are, if you don't agree with me, um, well, too bad. We'll have to wait till the chat room at the end and you can talk to me about it. <laughs> number three, <laughs> let go self-empty 
right? We talked about spiritualizing our ego earlier. So this is the antidote to that. Don't uh, buy into your ego as if it's the be all and end all of who you are. You are more than your ego. You are more than your humanness, right? You are a limitless child of God. You are beautiful, uh, intelligent beyond measure. And it's coursing through you and each one of us, every single being on this planet, every moment of every day. So you are nothing in the sense that you are not what you think you are in a, as a limited human being, but you are everything in terms of God flowing in and through you. And if you can self-empty into that awareness, it's called sunyata in, in Buddhism, uh, emptying yourself so that you can be full, right? There's, that, there's another contradiction. You empty so you could be full. I want to tell you a story, a story about a Westerner that goes to Japan. Uh, he he'd studied every single religion there was. He was very wise. He had numerous PhDs. Um, he was full of all information, but he knew something was missing. So he wanted to go to speak with a Zen master. So he went to Japan and settled down in front of a Zen master and said, Master, could you please teach me? I, I have an inkling to know a little more. And the master said, certainly, but let's have a cup of tea first. There's the tea again. And so they sat down and had a cup of tea. And, uh, you know, it was the Japan, so they were very formal in serving the tea. And the master took the teapot and started pouring the tea into, into the uh, Westerner's cup. Well, he filled it to the brim. And then he kept pouring and it fell all over the top of the brim onto the table, down onto the floor. And the Westerners thought to himself, this guy is nuts. There's nothing I can learn from him. I'm leaving. So uh, he was shocked, though. So he sta stayed there for a while, just looking dumbfounded at the master. The master was quiet. And then he turned to him and he said, just as the cup, when it's full, cannot take any more liquid, so your mind if it is full, cannot take any more information and knowledge. So I ask you to self-empty before I can teach you. And I love that because there's so much truth to that, isn't there? If we're full up with uh, preconceptions about what, what the truth is, it's, it's difficult to have a direct experience of the truth. Direct experience of the truth only comes when we are open and receptive. If you're teachable, as we agreed we were, we are open and receptive. There's more to learn. That's good. That means there's still some emptiness in there that can be filled. So on any given day, if you think you know it all, get rid of it. Throw it away. I know nothing. They say Socrates knew he was the wisest man in Athens. Why? Because he agreed that he knew nothing, right? He knew less than anybody else. That's why he was wise. And when you think you know everything, um, and there's some people out there that know everything, you know, you've, we've come across them, and God knows sometimes we feel the same way, don't we? Uh, it never works in a marriage if you think you know everything, does it? Or in any relationship. It's not helpful. It's good to stay open. And that brings me to number four. Be open to awe and wonder. Like the song said again, you know, I love that idea of everything is, t is, is our teacher. Yeah. So everything can be a moment of awe and wonder, which is, again, a childlike response to life. For me, it's Mother Nature. I just spent weeks in the in the Rockies and uh, thoroughly enjoying that landscape there and, and the beauty, beauty and diversity of nature. You can have awe and wonder for the universal principles of truth, which are endlessly uh, giving, aren't they, and yielding to us. It's amazing, the power of prayer. Um, connections that we have with, with our family, with our loved ones. Um, helping others can inspire awe and wonder. Just simple acts of giving. Uh, whatever it is for you, I'm not coming up with a, a complete list. This is for you to, to decide, too. What, what inspires you with awe and wonder, right? What, what inspires you with that? Wow, this is amazing. Yeah, art can do it, music can do it. Um, whatever it is, on a daily basis, open yourself to some kind of I'm saying it in a British way, aren't I? Or, uh, you, you might be knowing it as ah, but you know what I'm talking about awe and wonder, right? That openness to uh, 
being childlike again, you know, because that is so key to being in a, in a having a direct experience with the divine. Number five, we're halfway there. Relax, don't try so hard. You know, we're probably thinking, oh my God, I got one, two, three, four, I got to remember all these things. No, just simply relax. Don't try so hard. Who you are is enough. See, this is the message of Zogchen. Zogchen simply means great perfection. The essence of us is great perfection. We are already there, right? We've already received everything we could possibly need. Can you believe that? You mean I don't have to be fixed? I don't have to progress? I don't have to unfold? No, you don't. Everything is sure. So like the Sufis say, you have to learn how to unlearn, right? Unlearn all the things that told you you're not good enough. Unlearn all the things that keep you separate in some way. Unlearn the idea that you're just a simply a three-dimensional being subject to birth, sickness, and death. No, you're not. You're a beautiful child of God, and you are good enough just as you are, right? Who you are is wondrous. Ramana Maharshi, the great uh, saint from India, um, asked us to inquire, who am I? Who am I in truth? Uh, I'm not this body. I'm not this mind. I'm not this, these emotions. Who am I? And not even I am God, because that's another concept. It's simply he told, encouraged us to come to the realization, I am. I am. I am the affirmative impulse of the universe. I am that, that God essence in expression, that affirmative impulse in expression. And linked to that is number six. If we can relax, then we can breathe, right? Breathing is so important. Why? Because you can only breathe in the now, right? Have you ever tried breathing in the past? Doesn't work, does it? Ever tried breathing in the future? No, nope, doesn't work either. You can only breathe in the now. And so it's very salutary to breathe because then that grounds you in this present moment. And what's in this present moment? Everything, everything we could possibly need, right? There is no time or space to spirit. There's no time or space to God. There is only this present moment and it's perfect. And as long as you're in this moment, you are perfect too. If you're hanging out in the past or the future, then yeah, maybe we're letting some other stuff in. But even then, if you can look at the past and look at the future with honesty and genuineness, then you're back in the moment again because you're looking at it from the now. So breathe. Take time each day to breathe. You, hey, you're actually breathing all the time, aren't you? You didn't stop breathing. If you did, you wouldn't be around. So you're doing it already. Just be conscious of it. Be aware of it. What are we up to? That was six. Seven, do simple things with awareness. And I'm not talking about, I know everybody's talking about mindfulness right now. There's a danger that we become uh, obsessed with mindfulness. So look at me, look how mindful I am right now. That's not mindfulness. That's the ego grabbing onto mindfulness and saying, wow, I'm really in the flow right now. This is cool. Um, you know, that's, that's another part of the ego taking over again. Mindfulness simply means just being naturally aware, naturally present to what is at any given time with, without any bells and whistles, just being you, just being naturally you, having a cup of tea, having a cup of coffee without pretense, right? Just doing it, um, just being naturally, gracefully present to whatever it might be. And when I say simple things, I, I truly mean that we, we tend to want to do something dramatic and sometimes that's great, but oftentimes the simplest things are better, like making a cup of tea, um, like calling a friend, um, like um, shopping in the grocery store and having a chat with the person in, in line. You know, it's amazing what things will show up. I was on the way home from Colorado a couple of days ago, and I was in a truck stop and just getting the, you know, taking a potty break and uh, getting the soda or whatever it was. Noticed this young man, he was about 19 by the look of him, tall man, uh, good looking, and he kept looking at me. I thought, what's this? You know, what's wrong with me? You know, maybe he didn't like, I was in a, a, 
uh, the rural part of Texas. So maybe my my ponytail or something. I don't know what it was. But anyway, he kept looking at me. I looked back at him and then he looked away and I thought, well, whatever. And then, I, then he looked again and I said, hey, how you doing? Doing all right? He goes, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. And then, uh, then he walked away and then he turned and he walked back to me. I thought, oh, is he going to panhandle me or what's going on? And uh, so he came up to me and he said, do you know Jesus? And uh, I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> he said, well, Jesus is the way, the truth of the life. You know, unless you come to Jesus, you, you're going to hell. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the way and the truth of life. Jesus is love, right? The essence of, of the truth, essence of Jesus is love. So the way and the truth of the life, you know, that's that's love. You have to be loving every moment and every this, that. So then we are, went on and on from there. And then we started quoting scripture at each other and, and I said, uh, you know, have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. You know, you got to keep your mind focused on love, on the truth. He said, yeah, well, I guess God is love. Um, but Jesus is important. I said, <laughs> I said, well, you got, Jesus is love. It's OK, relax. And, and he, Jesus is going to be with us. Uh, he's always going to be there for us, he said. I said, yeah, it says at the end of Matthew that uh, Jesus will be with us until the end of time, until the end of the age. And. Then he said, thank you, brother, and he walked off. So <laughs> I don't know what the benefit of that was for him or for me, but it was certainly an interesting interaction. It was a chance to just affirm truth, right? And I could have said, well, actually, I'm a Hindu, and I don't really focus on Jesus, uh, more into, you know, Eastern philosophy. If I'd said that, then I probably wouldn't have had a nice interaction, you know, it would have all been about you're going to hell, etc." But instead, I decided just to uplift love, you know, and uh, see commonality there. And as a result, we had a, we got a good experience. So keep things simple, do simple things with awareness. Sometimes it's not necessary to tell somebody that's not ready to hear about Eastern religions, which I'm into a lot. Um, it's, it's just good to keep it, keep it simple. All right, number eight, here's a bit of a word salad. Remember that everything is everything. It is a bit of a word salad, isn't it? What's the heck he talking about? Everything is everything. But in a, in a very real sense, everything is everything, right? Everything is connected. Quantum physics tells us this. We know that in terms of ecology, everything is connected. Um, there is no separation. And, and so if, if everything is connected, then every point in the universe, every point in our lives, is the point of wholeness and oneness. God is present, not as a part, but God is present as wholeness, which is our theme today, right? God is present as wholeness in every place in this planet, which means in you, you are God in fullness and wholeness. And that's powerful because you, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be everywhere. You don't have to have understanding of all things in order to know the all right you just have to touch the hem of the garment this is the beauty of that story from uh, from the gospels when the woman touched jesus's garment just the hem of it she got the full healing and i love that that's the direct experience of truth you don't have to have this unbelievable understanding of all truth in order to have a direct experience you just have to do one little thing that connects you to the divine one little loving thing one little moment of aha and you've got the whole thing right that's the everything is everything so relax into that that you you have that amazing power to connect to the all at every moment we may say i live a simple life no you live an extraordinary life it may be simple but it's extraordinary. Everyone's life is extraordinary in that way. So, nine. If you know that everything is everything, then you naturally want to help someone, right? It's a, it's, it's a way to get out of yourself. Help them. And I'm not talking about being a do-gooder and all that, uh, you know, and feeling righteous about helping others. No, you just want to be magnanimous. You just want to be compassionate at any given time along the road, right? Just do something that can be helpful. And it can be the simplest thing. It could be talking with somebody in that truck stop. It, it, it could be talking to somebody in a checkout line. It could be determining to do a volunteer work, whatever it might be. Um, it, it can be smiling at someone. It can be honest, being honest with someone and not putting up with BS from them. 
Um, this is ways of helping somebody, right? Uh, but always do it from the highest, not from an ego basis, but from that sense that this is spirit expressing in me naturally, effortlessly. Getting out of ourselves creates greater magnanimity, expansive, it's expansive to ourselves. We are welcoming. And then finally, and I've said this before, but I'm, I'm saying it again because it bears repeating, give yourself permission to relax, right? That was number five and it's number 10 because some things have to be done twice, uh, you know, so relax. It's it, We said we were going to relax at five, but by the time we get to 10, we're all uptight again. So we got to relax. We got to relax our bodies. We got to relax our emotions, our minds, and just have a good time. Um, it does bear repeating, all is well, right? In truth, all is well. We are beings of infinite possibility, beings of joy, beings of peace, beings of possibility. And so when we determine that that is the truth of ourselves, then we begin to deeply connect with the divine, deeply connect with truth. And then life unfolds. Who is it that said, you know, I believe in luck. The, the harder I work, the more lucky I am. I think it was one of our presidents. But there's something to that. When we determine that we're going to move in the direction of God, then God moves in our direction, right? Uh, there's an old saying from the Sufis, you, you move one step towards God, God moves a hundred steps towards you. That step is to be honest, open, relaxed, in remembrance of the magnificence that you are. When you do all those things, God is there. The presence of truth is there for you um, to live a magnificent life. Okay, I've talked more than enough. I'm being quiet now. Thank you so much for welcoming me again. Blessings. <laughs>